Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jane O'Connell. I'm here in sort of, I'm going to confuse you because I'm here not on the hat that I'm, you might think I am in. I'm president of the Altman Foundation, and there's an Altman presence on the board. But I'm actually here as a board member of Philanthropy New York to say welcome and thank you to the panel and welcome all of you. I'm also here to say, there, for those of you who don't hang on the Philanthropy New York website, um, every minute that there has been a change in the program because Luther Reagan, who was our moderator, who was also a new me board member of the Altman Foundation, <laughs> um, had an, as a, a minor, but minor enough that not minor enough that he couldn't make he could come accident over the weekend, and so had to withdraw. But the exciting thing is that he, his colleague Kate Starr, with whom he worked, and who he suggested has agreed at the last minute to moderate, and Kate is absolutely, totally ready to do this on a 24-hour notice. Um, and so, <laughs> so I don't have to say anything more other than to welcome you from Philanthropy New York. Um, this has been a topic that Altman and a number of us have been talking about for a number of years and have wanted to kind of spread the word. Um, so I turn it over to Kate. Great, thanks, Jane. I am happy to be here, and I'm excited uh, that there's so much interest in PRI, program-related investments. And just so that we know, I'd be curious to know how many people in the room have actually done a PRI. Okay, great. I have too. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> you know, we've got various perspectives uh, up here. One of the room. We've got John uh, from Altman who's really going to talk from the perspective of a board member. Uh, we've got Jennifer who's going to talk about what it's like to, to take the, the money uh, that we invest uh, as foundations, uh, the philanthropists, and, and how it gets used on the ground. Uh, and then we're going to hear from John McIntosh from Sea Change who's going to be talking about what is um, the useful and uh, the way it works when you can rely on a trusted intermediary to really work with you through your process and really help you be effective in making program-related investments. So that's us, but before we continue, it would be great just to do a little popcorn around what's, what's top of mind. So PRIs have been around since 1968 after they were pioneered uh, by MacArthur and Ford Foundation. Um, we at the Heron Foundation uh, started using them in 1997 um, and then grew our practice over time uh, since then and continue to use program related investments. But I'm curious to know what brought you here today. Um, if you just want to, to raise your hand or throw out kind of what's top of mind for you today, May 21st, 2015, on the subject of PRI. Do you feel like at the staff level you've got consensus and buy-in? Okay. Okay. Great. Oh, great. <laughs> I, as an English major, I'd love to help you figure that out. <laughs> that would be great. So, kind of subjects and, and how these can be applied. Any other thoughts? Yeah. On the question of subjects or objects 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 or
support a foundation that um, is involved with uh, international children's programming, particularly vulnerable children. So I, I don't know how that would translate into a very strict PRI. But I, on another issue or another hat, I'm curious how this asset class fits within other asset classes if one is doing an overall asset allocation. I represent a small, relatively small family foundation, and um, we did do a PRI recently, okay. and we're learning a lot. <laughs> Hi, spoke. <laughs> um, I would be interested to know sort of what your advice on how you decide at the scale, the proportion of a PRI. What is a good size PRI based on based on how many assets you have and how your assets are distributed before you get um, into it, which is something we didn't do. <laughs> and also, how does it size relative? Relative to the needs of the potential, exact, yes, yeah. that okay. too, yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to throw out kind of top of mind thoughts? Okay, well, that I think we actually covered a, a lot of the main, the main opportunity and challenges of kind of thinking through this tool. And, you know, and, and keeping in mind that program related investments um, or impact investing in general in a lot of places tends to be this. It's a go-between. It's, it's both program and investing, but it's, it's sort of neither fish nor fowl. And so whenever you're trying to go through this process and you're looking for opportunities, you're really having to be flexible. And um, that's also the exciting part, that it brings you into partnership with new, new people, new partners. Um, and in my experience, you actually learn a lot about other parts of your business or in your grant making or your pure investment activities. It, it can be a... Um, and the source of a lot of new learning uh, for the uh, for the organization as a whole. So that's great. And so we've had a chance to hear from the from the crowd about what's on their mind. So John, why don't we start with you? Um, just talk a little bit about your experience at Open and kind of the process. We've got some folks who are early in the process here. Sure. And uh, some success stories and maybe some things that make you scratch your head. Uh, we started Continues to be uh, very active in the PRI. Player may be the most active out there. And uh, we knew about them. Sharon King, who was then the executive director of Para, was on our board. Uh, and so when the idea began to bubble and surface, um, then on this uh, sheet of paper is how did you convince the board? It's not difficult. Necessarily, uh, uh, Sharon passed uh, away last year tragically. Uh, it was a <coughs> wonderfully credible uh, source of information and insight. And we realized you know, the case was made, discussed that Open Foundation uh, could easily, in the New York City context, $250 million um, had uh, uh, by nature size of our grants limited um, impact. We, had, we thought we were punching above our weight, but we had limited uh, impact and we needed more tools in our uh, in our philanthropy uh, kit in order to make uh, an impact. And this we realized uh, was one of them. What are the other tools? Um, obviously you want to uh, use whatever leverage you've got with the limited Money you have. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the tools that we have long had is intelligent, focused, well researched grant. Uh, another just sort of thinking, thinking about this a little ahead of time. Uh, another is uh, the relationships that our program officers continue to maintain with our grantees, adding because of their knowledge of the field, their relationships. 
relationships, their experience, their sheer brain power, uh, a lot of value to their teams that's leveraged. Uh, uh, but PRIs has a uh, another use of the balance sheet, so to speak, struck us as a good way uh, to enhance uh, that leverage. Um, and it's proven to be the case. Uh, we have done, I think the number is six. PR is not, it, it, I think counting, maybe not, I can't look at this data. Uh, the one that we've done through the agency that uh, I've seen change in general is way up. So, but it has, um, it has given us, not only as Kate mentioned, um, new kinds of relationships, insight, into our uh, mission focus, uh, but also expanded uh, our mission beyond grants. I'll just give you a quick example of the way <coughs> that, um, that, we can, that we can use these, uh, these tools. We made uh, about two years ago, I think it was, a million dollar uh, loan, uh, one year loan to the front of the city of New York, which is supposed to be a return receivable financing for New York City uh, nonprofits have for the most part government receiver, which are money good, but they still <laughs> pay, particularly after uh, the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, they do financing very effectively. They're, they're actually on the bank. Uh, they have uh, uh, limited, somewhat limited of the nature of those sources of capital. We didn't want to basically um, expense uh, and, and then servicing costs by helping to pay for the residents of loans. We really just want to promise you that staff good for obvious reasons. So we used front of the city of New York as an intermediary. We, we thought we might be able at the outset to restrict their on lending, so to speak, to our grantees. We realized after several discussions that that was totally impractical. And so we said to them, we can be documented in a very general way. Um, as long as we, through our works, fit um, our general mission, as long as a reasonable number of them uh, are within our grantee uh, parameters in our mission. We'd also like to know on a quarterly basis what you're doing. And so we sent us a list. And we got the first list, and there were uh, 60 borrowers uh, from amounts ranging from 15000 up to $150,000. And we realized that we had, through that facility, uh, reached a, a thread and, and therefore an impact among either nonprofits currently granting money to or nonprofits that in another circumstance we might grant money to, we reached a thread and even a depth of, um, of impact that we never could have done through um, the grant money process. You don't want to make 60 grants, $15,000. So when for the city of New York does all that, they do the due diligence, they do the loan administration, Enforcement, uh, they're just an, uh, an intermediary for us. Uh, we have actually searched through other intermediaries. We finally found one, it's not quite serving the same uh, function because I'm friends with the city of New York because they don't have any capital. Uh, but, uh, but they have intellectual capital. And so, uh, again, it's a form of leverage. How can we get the most out of the limited resources we have? Talk a little bit about Great. If you would, I think in response to your question about getting started, how, how did you get started and what was the right size? And so now, you know, you know our first deal was a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> so that might be normal. Uh, going to your question, uh, we were, our first, our first deal was um, with Common Ground, which, uh, <coughs> uh, which we 
is trying in a very hot New York real estate market to get enough way of financing resources to bid for properties that were on the market for a week that were snapped up by for profit enterprises. Uh, and we were asked to join a group subordinated to the Walters uh, by Deutsche Bank. Mission-driven investors, the four mission-driven investors, lenders took a subordinate position in a twelve million dollar deal. I say it was a nightmare uh, because this is, despite having been around since nineteen sixty-nine, uh, still kind of virgin territory. Uh, and no, nobody quite knew uh, how to strike the uh, agreement among. Creditors, particularly the subordinated creditors, we had different subordinated creditors demanding different things. There was no, there was no well understood uh, format for doing that. No one, no, and, and generally in the commercial market, if you get a situation like that, the lead bank cracks the whip. You could barely pressure from the borrower to get the deal done. No, there was no pressure being exerted from anyone. He just sat there. Uh, and it took a year uh, to, um, to document. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't have pro bono counsel. Um, and uh, uh, the legal fees started uh, to, uh, to mount. And um, we were, we were uh, somewhat put off uh, by that process. Uh, and we resolved to um, make the investment uh, up front and, uh, and establish very, very simple uh, loan documents. Uh, in fact, uh, this is after the first deal got in effect. And I think it was the landmarks of the service that helped us do that. The borrower that had borrowed several times in the PRI market. So we have now much more standardized uh, uh, documentation, and we have not uh, participated other than from sea change uh, in a multi-party uh, transaction. And if we did, we want one person, with cracker or not, involved in hurting uh, these cats. Uh, and that's another advantage of the uh, uh, and, and, and you know, the PRIs are not all uh, all uh, all sunshine and uh, and got candy. Um, there are costs uh, associated with some uh, diligence, staff time, uh, staff not prepared to making, uh, the amount of impact uh, you're making, and um, you, have to be, you have to be careful about that. Uh, and, and, and you can also waste a lot of time talking to people because, you know, if you, <laughs> so everybody knows in the foundation firm, not to me so much because I'm a trustee, but when you have a pot of money, uh, you get a lot of phone calls. Um, and if you have money to lend, uh, you get a lot of phone calls and so Unless you're focused on exactly what you want to do and how you want to leverage your resources, you can waste a lot of time uh, talking to uh, wonderful organizations uh, like the nonprofits uh, all day long. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's not uh, a unique experience. I too have had that similar experience. It got to the point where we had uh, thought about. Instituting sort of MOUs at the beginning of our process. I knew you were going to kind of working toward a term sheet and then working with a group of people. You set some expectations for behavior around how quickly documents get turned around. If there's no real formal role for like a bank or, or for someone to do that, even informally amongst the group, it's flattery. Kind of what we, what we agreed to do 
through this process. And, and I would say draw on your experience from, from, from grant making. So if somebody's getting bogged down, there might be probably a reason. And so picking in your relationship management skills and things like that are definitely applicable here. But you can talk to Jennifer about, um, oh, about sort of a, you're labeled as a case study. And so just talk to us oh, in the next okay. 10 minutes about how we have talked a little bit about this in theory and from the foundation perspective. Help us understand what it's like right. on the ground. Great. Um, Cindy, how do I get to the first page? Put that up. Are you, are you doing it or do I do it? Okay. There we go. Okay. Do I need to speak into this for recording this? Hello? Okay. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here today, and the first thing that I have to make sure everybody knows um, is I'm in this unique position of um, John McIntosh said to me, he said, well, has Grayson ever done PRIs? And I said, well, they didn't work out too well, and, um, or and, uh, and John said, but you weren't there, right? And I said, that's right. And he said, well, then this is good. <laughs> so um, what I will say as I get into kind of talking about this case study is that I had to do a lot of digging up of old documents. And um, really, everyone who was involved is no longer there. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of you know, let everyone know that kind of what we're talking about is, is looking back and um, I'll try to be as helpful as possible about talking about exactly what went on. Um, first of all, Grayson, some people may not be familiar with us. We're a youth organization. We're an $18 million hybrid for-profit social enterprise and a nonprofit. We're best known for Grayson Bakery, which is $14 million mission-based food manufacturer. We are best known for being the primary supplier of brownies and Ben and Jerry's worldwide. We sell them 5 million pounds of brownies a year. We have an open hiring policy, so we hire a lot of people from the incarcerated families homeless. Um, and then we have a number of nonprofit services like child care, um, housing, and support services, workforce development, and creative arts. We're in Yonkers, just north of up the Bronx in a low-income part of Yonkers, Southwest Yonkers, in a very um, high-income county of Westchester. So let me tell you about an unsuccessful PRI. Um, oh, wait, the bakery's still there. Brownies are still being made. Brownies are still being made, and but you'll see why. And just so you know, I, I came on board in 2011. So everything I'm talking about with this was before my time. Um, but um, so, but of course, since I've been there, everything's gone spectacularly. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, so back in 2000, um, two well-known foundations decided to lend Grayson $250. Thousand dollars, the two two hundred fifty thousand dollar PRIs. There were other things going on in terms of loans and everything, but I decided to focus on these because they were really kind of pure PRIs. Is what we're talking about today. And at the time, Grayson Bakery was in this kind of little baking facility. Um, it was an old pasta warehouse, and it had really run out of capacity. Ben and Jerry's was growing, and the organization wanted to build a new bakery. And so, and again, trying to get some context, I really had to go back to the actual documents. And what it said was these guys came in to help finance the construction of a new bakery facility. And what was interesting is that the bakery is a for-profit entity. So structurally, this was kind of unusual too because the investment came in through the nonprofit side and then funneled over through to the bakery. Um, and it was, you know, unsecured debt, pretty 
coordinated modest interest rates, four and a half percent and six percent. So at the time these guys came in, so in terms of kind of the due diligence of looking, hmm, what did this bakery do? The 99 financials, it was about a four million dollar operation. Um, if you look at kind of the cash from the business, it was about 200,000, you know, not big margins. And there wasn't a lot of debt because this little building didn't have much of a mortgage. There wasn't a lot. So, then 2001 to 2004, they made the ginormous new bakery building. And I don't know who decided, but let's fund it all with debt. You know, how many emerging businesses do you know that are funded exclusively with debt? No reason to have any equity. Um, and let's bring in a very expensive architect. And of course, we have one price tag, but the price tag is, you know, surprise. Right, surprise, it goes up. And so by the end of 2004, we were up to $7 million in debt. So we went from 350,000 of debt to 7 million of debt. So that's okay. You just have to have sales you know, increase tenfold and you can support them, right? Um, so 2005, um, sales are up to almost 7 million, which is a big increase. Got the growth, the added capacity did help. Um, but, you know, first of all, that wasn't going to be enough anyway. And then still a business, and this I couldn't really get some context on, but when I started to look back at the numbers, I'm like, oh my god, what the heck that was cost to do? And they had some kind of ingredient hiccup, and so they were losing $500,000 in 2005. So it was a step. And Jennifer, who was paying the debt service at this point? The nonprofit? Or they up the nonprofit, and then I mean, there were so many cases of they were bringing in new money, and, and I said that it, it looked, there was all sorts of machinations going on. But the nonprofit was really keeping the bakery afloat, which is not the mission of Grayson. The mission of Grayson is to take the profits from the for profit social enterprise to support the nonprofit. So everything got turned around. So then 2006 to 2010, um, you know, the bakery sales continued to grow, but not a lot, you know, and it was really just in line with Ben and Jerry's. And I'll be very honest, Ben and Jerry's was extremely patient with Grayson um, because, you know, they could have gone and gotten those brownies much cheaper somewhere else, but they cared about what we were doing. Um, and, you know, not only the bakery not really have money to serve debt, then you don't have money to buy capbacks and fund working capital. I mean, I, I hear stories about, like, the vendors, you know, bring in the bag of money and they'll let us have our sugar this week. I mean, you know, it was really hard, I think, for them to run the business in the correct way, warehouse your raw materials, you know, keep the production, like, if you have to keep stopping production because you run out, then it's rather inefficient, right? So, 2010, I love reading on it, by the way, and this was the, <laughs> this, this was the language in the 2010 audit, is Auditors indicate substantial doubt of the company's ability to continue as a going concern. Substantial doubt. Ouch. So um, it was ugly. And basically, these original PRI investors, I mean, they were supposed to be out like in 2003 or 2005. And I just keep looking at stuff. One of them doubled down. But, you know, after a while, there was no debt service. You know, there were all these um, forbearance agreements and everything. It just went on and on. So finally, in the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, and this was pre my time, and it was truly heroic, we did a major financial restructuring to save the organization. Grayson would have. 
and um, we got two and a half million of debt forgiveness, and every lender took a huge haircut. And so the CRI guys lost two thirds of their money, just like everybody else. So um, it wasn't a happy situation for anyone. And what I would say in terms of lessons learned are twofold. First of all, and again, I wasn't there, and I'm kind of cynical. Um, what were people thinking? I mean, does the deal make sense? I know mission's important, and you want to give people the benefit of the doubt and everything, but you know, don't forget the smell test. And I don't see any way how people could have thought about this much debt and how quickly could they ramp up, even if the capacity was there, I mean, what, what was the game plan there? And I couldn't dig up what the projections were that were presented to the original lenders. But I do know one lender who said to me, you know, we really like Grayson and we really wanted to help, but we just didn't see any way of getting there. And this is also, I think, really, really important is, um, I think there's this idea, well, if the guys who are in it just spend their money are putting their money in, then look at us, like, that should be okay, right? But, you know, the banks ended up being bigger idiots than anyone. And so, well, no, I mean, I mean, Key, Key Bank lost a million bucks. And, um, so just because the guys who are in it to make money are in, I think we all know that banks don't necessarily always do the smartest thing. So they might be a different motivation, right? A commercial motivation, yeah. Right, right. And so anyway, but since this is something that we've now done, now we have a good story. Um, last year we had a faith. Um, socially responsible investment program um, approached us. They really cared about social justice. Um, they came in and they lent us 250000 to fund the acquisition of a new wrapping machine. Um, they liked what we were doing. Um, again, again, kind of the same thing, low interest, unsecured, no collateral willing to be subordinated. I mean, it was a beautiful thing for us. And, you know, the bakery has solid cash flow. We pay them every month. It's, it's a term loan. They always get their money on time. We've been able to grow the business as a result. Everyone's happy. So, um, you know, it can work. So, it just depends. <laughs> so, I'm sure, did you, in underwriting this, uh, PRI, did you discuss and disclose kind of what happened before and, and did people get comfortable with the history or was, or was this party kind of coming in new without really a deep understanding of the prior issues around the default system? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I don't know how much um, they were focused on what had happened in the past, but you know, the reality is everybody who did that stuff before and made those decisions were gone. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, you know, it was a new CEO of Bakery, it was a new CFO. Um, you know, so we had to, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. When I started at Grayson um, as CFO, my first job was Key Bank was still in as for piece of mortgage and a line of credit, and they wanted. So my job was to go out and find a new lender. And I was like, great. Like, hey, we stiffed everyone in the past, mm -hmm. and we have one customer. Give us money. <laughs> so um, but today we have $2 million line of credit, and uh, very low finance mortgage. And we're good. Cash flow. It's a nice thing to have when Cash you're lending, low. right? So the other thing is, is obviously we were unique in that we were a revenue generating. We are a revenue generating entity. There is a level of possibility. But, you know, I, I come from Wall Street. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, do you think the people who are in charge 
impacted the decisions to bring that in. And that's where they went back down to the And one other clarifying question. This PRI, was it made to the bakery itself, to the for-profit or the non-profit? It was made to the for-profit. So that might so, also yeah. be helpful with clarity. Yeah, but it was interesting. This was the very first time it was done for for-profit. And so that was kind of the thing. Was it going to funnel through the non-profit? And they were fine with doing it this way. But we would have done it the other mm -hmm. way as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, we can stop the interest. I mean, we now pay. We pay interest taxes. So the interest is deductible. That's what we care on. It's interesting. I have seen Jennifer's story about Grayson. And uh, it comes up again as what, what's really the right way to help. And kind of in this story, it's really saying, okay, you know, I, you said one of the original PRI makers had doubled down. So if they went from 250 to 500 on a, what was it, a double million dollar debt, it's not, even though it's it's double for them, which might feel like a lot and a lot more exposure, like they're really stepping up, it's not enough, it's not enough to really help out with the whole credit situation. So, so to me, it sounded like a little finger in the ground. Yeah, I, and, and that's the thing where I can't give more insight. I really wonder what the backstory is. It's like, you know, we know things aren't going well. Can we give us more? So no, yeah. I don't quite know how those discussions a, went. I feel like there's a, a good lesson <laughs> in there. Yeah. Do you have a comment? Or? Yeah, that's like a different point on the negative thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just like the foreign foundations that had made those commitments. So then, uh, what, four or five years later, they've got to write off two-thirds of their investment as a loss. So I'm just wondering what that, and obviously we don't, we don't know when they're not here, but what that might have looked like for those foundations who had to write off a loss for a PRI. This is all that I know, which is that um, actually when I first came in to Grayson, And we were working with someone who said that they could come and get the funding of it. And so the guy made a couple phone calls and came back and said, Oh, you didn't tell me about your history with X and X. So it was not, you know, they, you know, I even the first thing I have to do when I see people from those organizations. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there. <laughs> so, um, you know, I apologize for the sins of the past. So, uh, from what I understand, it was not, um, it was not, they were very disappointed. And, and I don't know how much, you know, a PRI is going to make. So, do, do foundations that typically have, is there an, investment banker or somebody who can help them place these investments and what do diligence do they have to do before they can invest money in one? You know, what does that look yeah. like? Generally, uh, I think most foundations and we have to again, this uh, sea change uh, much should be to What we do uh, with one of our uh, PRIs, which turned into a great bakery, uh, is very interesting question. I'm not sure I know uh, what we do. I can tell you that uh, we don't have any audit or accounting problems. No, it's not. No, that's no, it doesn't no. work. I mean, because they're they're treated as they're treated yeah, as a grant. Right. They're treated as a grant, and then when they come back. Then that then so so these are sort of condition related investments are not your minimum required distribution. Yeah. These funds qualify if you want to count it against your they're separately reported I think by now you can kind of figure out this PR time. But but I am I'm just imagining how we go on the foundation is a third point to create a Grayson bakery and I I can't I don't I can't tell you. Uh, I, exactly. <laughs> I, 
Exactly. And, and we have made over our 101 year history lots of grants uh, to dicey the enterprise business that haven't worked out uh, terribly well. Uh, uh, we don't uh, talk a lot about them, but every foundation has that uh, experience and uh, useless nonprofit will submit a, a, a grant request, uh, a letter of inquiry or grant request, and do all the diligence in the world. And we also uh, uh, do financial analysis of the nonprofit. We don't often turn down a grant because the foundation is the nonprofit is shaky, but we want to know what we're getting into. We don't want to obviously make a grant to someone who's going to be out of business in six months, waste of money. Uh, uh, but we do face several situations where uh, the grantee is on uh, shaky, uh, shaky ground, uh, and we we decide as a matter of our mission and philosophy that we're in the business to take risks. So were we to be presented with this with a grace and bakery, I can see that argument surfacing right away. Let's give them another two hundred and fifty. Uh, it is a risky enterprise. The chances. Of them making it through this difficulty are uh, one in three, but we think that if the following things happen, it will happen, that they will be able to that. And so, again, again, one of the advantages of having an intermediary is that I'm not sure that sales is not supposed to taste like that. That's right, we're not supposed to taste like that. Is that a third party? Uh, sort that out because those are those are difficult conversations. Even if you're purely commercially driven, they're difficult conversations. I think I mean you really hear on it, John, with this idea of risk. You know, it's so not something we usually talk about with our grant making. It certainly comes into the more explicit discussion around CRI, and certainly is there when we talk about our investment portfolio. And I think you know keeping you know not only the risk of, of the financial. Um, resources of the, of the foundation in mind, but also the risk of, of whether or not you're going to be able to achieve your admission objective in whatever deal that you're looking at. And you say, okay, well, let's make the best decision we can. But at the end of the day, if you end up uh, losing your money, as the Parent Foundation has, and so I think that definitely got to be on the table of discussions with your board and kind of thinking through that there will be losses um, for the most part um, at some point. You know, did we do everything we thought we could do to ensure that our mission objectives were met? Are we managing that mission risk along with our financial risk? I think there's really a way to think about it that's helpful to those situations because they, they can get very specific. But it's a great segue into John and to talk to kind of uh, intermediaries because I, I think, especially for people who are new to ARI and thinking about this, very valuable resources and intermediaries of, of, of many sorts. Who can really play a role in um, driving more capital and really increasing your ability and effectiveness and, and using PRIs to achieve your objectives? So, um, so Sea Change is an intermediary, and, and as the team has heard me say many times, I, I really truly believe that God hates intermediaries and is on long term technology enabled missions to either wipe us out or keep us on the run. And so, so we're trying to be very disciplined. And only get involved, only insert ourselves as an intermediary between funders and not for profits, where we're really convinced that there's that there's a role for us. Well, we're really convinced there's a role for an intermediary, and nobody seems to be doing it. And so I'm going to try to make the case for why we set ourselves up with the Altman Foundation and the Hector Foundation and the Thompson Family Foundation and one of the private foundation as an intermediary in the PRI space. Um, so the first thing is just sort of first principles. Um, I believe, we believe, that foundations are a natural source of this sort of capital, that, um, that they have uh, balance sheets um, that, that, that can and should be put to use, not simply as grant making for grants, but for other, for other uh, investment purposes as well. Um, 
and we also believe that you know that as best I can tell, although there's lots of chatter, um, PRI is still a small thing. There's there's not really that many deals and that many dollars, and the deals and dollars that there are are concentrated in a pretty small number of foundations. Um, and the third thing we believe is that that we decide whether a foundation has decided to do PI or not. And, I, and you can have a principled argument. I've heard people say, look, we just think the world's a better place if we make all the money we can on the investment side and give it away. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. But, but, but what we are saying is that even those foundations that want to do PI, that have decided that they want to do PI, um, face a handful of challenges. I think the first three are sort of internal challenges um, that they feel, and it's probably true, that they internal to their staff don't have the knowledge and expertise to do this necessarily. I think they sometimes feel that that a PRI, which is both it has investing kind of bits to it and programming kind of bits to it, um, require that the financial teams and the program teams work together. And in many foundations, they, that's not normally what they do. Um, I think that for many foundations, unless you have the scale of a Ford or a Rockefeller or the all-in commitment level of a Heron. Um, most people can't afford to, to hire dedicated PRI folks. Um, so those are some three internal challenges. And, th and then I think even if you fixed all those, there's a couple of other problems. One is that the transaction costs here are really high. I mean, these are, these are small deals by and large. Um, and the due diligence costs, the legal costs, the audit costs, the management costs are, are high in proportion to the, to the deals. Um, and maybe you care about that, and maybe you don't, but it's real. Um, and then I think the final thing, and I shouldn't have said weak deal flow. I think it's it, it's a it's a it's an uh, it's a sporadic, spotty market. So it's it's hard to get all charged up. You know, Daniel, who works for CJ, if we if we said you're the PRI guy, like most days he'd have nothing to do. He'd say, hey boss, like it's kind of slow, um, right? It's just the way it is. Whereas if you said go buy commercial paper or you know invest in public stocks, like he'd always have something to do. And he did badly, he could do it well, but he wouldn't have like slow day. If you're the PRI guy, it's kind of slow. So that's, that's what's our sort of starting position. Um, and we felt that maybe, um, and this was really co-created with the Altman Foundation, um, that maybe we could set up a fund that would address some of those issues. The, the four foundations that wanted to make more PRI than they were making and struggled with the issues that we talked about, maybe we could create a collective vehicle that worked on, on some of it. So we call this a collective effort by sea change and four New York found, focused foundations to make flexible, high impact investment capital available to organizations working with it on behalf of low income New Yorkers. You notice it doesn't say PRI. I mean, it said PRI in the title, just because you know, that was easy. Um, but our interest is not in making PRIs. It is true that the investments we make can all be counted as PRI. But our interest is making non-grant flexible capital available to New York City not-for-profits. Um, it just happens to be the case that if you do that, you can count them as PRI if you want to. Um, and so we, we think our structure should, and this is all prospective benefits because we're very early in this. Um, one is it should lower transaction costs. And we have one example of that already. You know, we get little sea change, as John so kindly said, has no money. And so we get pro bono legal the four foundations that support the fund do not. So we trade four paid legal bills for one pro bono bill. That's a lower transaction cost right there. Um, we think we can synthesize expertise. Um, five minds are better than one. And so by working together with the four foundations, hopefully we'll make better decisions than any of us would alone. Um, we can dedicate resources. I mean, if Daniel wouldn't have a full-time job being one foundation PRI guy, at least working on behalf of four of them, it's closer to a full-time job. So we can I think we can dedicate resources to see change collectively for the group that no, no individual foundation could dedicate. Um, the second thing is, you know, we think that the foundations who participate will end up owning smaller pieces of more deals than if they did this alone. They probably end up owning larger pieces of of a smaller number of deals particularly when John says he doesn't want to work with others because of the nightmare, so that we can mitigate risk by creating a, a diversified portfolio, and also by being on the case here. Um, if things start to go belly up, um, you know, our reputation is on the line. Um, so I think we'll be a little bit more active in management than the foundations might be on their own. Um, and then I think as importantly, try to be responsive to non-for-profit needs. 
And by coordinating what would otherwise be four distinct investors, one set of legal documents, all that kind of stuff, um, hopefully we can give not-for-profit what they need. And then finally, um, it's because we're structurally separate from the foundations, we can manage information and, and handle confidentiality in a way that simply would not be possible if the not-for-profit were going direct drive to the foundations. Um, and then finally, you know, we think one benefit is that the sea change has a network, our foundations have a better network. This is collectively a tool that we can offer to that network. Um, and we can also keep origination costs lower because we're not actually starting from scratch. Um, you know, we already have relationships with grantees or with others to whom we can say, hey, we're now in the GRI business, so if you need a loan, you know, call 1-800-C-CHANGE. Um, what is it, if you're interested in it? So the PRI fund is a Delaware LLC. Um, we, the participants, including the C-CHANGE, are members. So everybody gets what's called a K-1, um, which reports their share of the income um, from the LLC. Um, we are the manager of it. We're also a participant. It's very important to us to be a participant. Obviously, as John said, we don't have any money. So, so our participation is small. Uh, we're about 2.5% of the fund, but it's very important to us that we had our own money in these investments alongside the participants. It helps us think as a principal and not merely an agent. Um, uh, the participants make three-year commitments. Here's how much money I could see investing through the, the PRI fund. Um, and they've all committed to cover our costs of doing the work. Um, we are simply getting our costs recovered. We're not looking to make money off this activity. Um, and we've given them a cap so that if we go hog wild, um, we, we see change swallow that. We're not pushing that on to investors. Um, this is what's called a club fund or a pledge fund. Um, which is, is sort of a tricky thing that, that we took from the for-profit world. So each participant retains sole discretion over what investments they join in. So we do the work and we say, it's the bakery. Someone says, I love it, I love workforce. And someone else says, no, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an anti-obesity funder. I hate the fact that they make brownies. Like whatever, for whatever reason, people have the ability to, to opt in or opt out. I mean, obviously, if someone's constantly opting out, we have to have a different conversation. Um, and in each case, even if people have opted out, now we are the, the PRI fund is the lender. The PRI fund is the counterparty. The PRI fund has made loans, um, which makes it easier in terms of one set of legal documents. This is, I should say, this is, a, this is all subject to the Investment Company Act and security law. These are securities. PRI fund sold to the Shoot Kick Foundation. We're now closed under security law, so even if you beg us to join in, you can't um, because it's closed. Um, but you know, there's a certain complexity in doing that. And if we didn't get Davis Cole pro bono help, we never could have got this done. Never could have got this done. Um, so what, what are we actually targeting? We're looking at making secured and unsecured loans. We could write credit guarantees. We could buy equity, quasi-equity, social impact bonds. So in theory, um, it's broad. I think in practice, um, most of the investments will end up being, and when people say to me, you know, most nonprofits shouldn't borrow money, I say, well, you're right. Um, how, would, you know, how, would they, how would they pay us back? They'll, they'll kill themselves, they'll get over letters. Most of the loans we're gonna make either are real estate based, like Grayson, um, or there's a working capital need, um, or interesting, but harder to find, are places where the not-for-profit is entering into a new activity and needs capital to do that. Um, you know, given the size of our fund, I think we're looking at 250,000 to a million dollars, perhaps alongside others. Below 250, we just get crushed from a transaction cost standpoint. Above a million, there's too much risk. Um, this is not a long-term fund, so we're hoping for things that we can get back in three or four years. And as required under the PRI rules, um, you know, we consult with our foundations case by case to talk about what seems to be the right balance of what the not-for-profit needs um, and what we need financially. So the interest rate or the return is determined on a case by case basis. Yes? Mm, I would say zero and, and six percent, probably. I mean, zero people, some people will squirm. Um, uh, but it's, it's possible. I mean, we, might, we might propose something. But yeah, they can all say no. And the point is, there's an iterative discussion around. Like, I hope, I'm not convinced the Greystone investment was a failure just because people lost their money. But we might have gone into that saying, you know what? This is a grant with the potential for a rebate. We think we're going to do this. 
Now, let's kick their board in the rear end and get some more grant money in here because you can't do a project that's 100% debt or something like that. So I'm, because it's a small group who we communicate with in real time, I don't think we need to have hard and fast rules about what we could or couldn't do. I don't think we'll ever do anything at zero, by the way, but I'm just saying it's, it, it wouldn't be impossible to have that, that discussion. Um, please. Uh, are you saying that that agent will be the grant money to invest in the school fund? No, it's up to the foundation. We, we do not, when we initiated our PRI program, decided to be on top of Stephen Bell and Principal. No, 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 Yes, it is because because it's because it qualifies as PRI. So so the structure is all the members of this LLC are not for profits. They're all foundations and us. And because of all the things we've done, the purchase of membership interests in the in in the PRI fund can, can count as PRI. Well, I, I, I'm curious, okay. Interestingly, um, we thought one of them, one of them said, eh, no, this is not this grant is money. And then they said, eh, I don't want to do that. So all of them are, are counting the, the money that they give the fund to make investment, to make those investments as an investment. We've also given them the option, and we get a little bit inside baseball, but the, the CJ does never want to hold money in advance when we need it. It's just bad from a risk management standpoint. So, but foundations don't want to write the ticket package with checks every two days. So the way we've done it is we draw capital from the foundations semi-annually to cover our costs, but we draw capital from the foundation to make investments only when we're making investments. And, and the capital to cover the costs of running the PRI fund can be made as grants to see change. And one foundation is doing that and three aren't. Three are capitalizing this fund. Three. Now, John makes the investment himself. Pay it back, you've got to put it back out on the street for the next three months. But the part of the funding is seat changes that are part of the one from that, the round number. Yeah, the round implies a, a scheme. What I would say is we can, when we get, the word part. When, we get when we get when we get capital it's not a good word. We back <laughs> right. we, when we get capital back from these investments, God willing we'll have a discussion with the funders who want us to keep it and recycle it because we think we can make new investments. We want to send it, us to send it back to you. So, so I, would, I would describe it as there's, there's flexibility. I don't think we would want to hold money unless there was a good use, you know, unless we thought that you know, we were going to find new deals to do. Um, and this is a small enough activity that I don't think that the Altman Foundation or anybody else is going to say, oh my God, this is change is going to send us back a drop smacking amount of money because we're not buying equity in Facebook or whatever it is. There's, these these investments are pretty much upside proof. Um, it's 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 you know it's it's <laughs> so so I I wouldn't we're not going to have a large amount of money to park. Um, let me just talk about the objectives in the last week. So three things: um, deal flow. You know, are we in the flow? Do we do? Can we find at least six things to do over three years? Um, this was a debate, and 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 um, I'll just put it out there. We have said that our objective is to earn a positive rate of return in aggregate. Um, so any number more than zero would qualify. My original hope for this fund was to create a portfolio where the expected rate of return was minus 20%. I just felt originally that, um, that, that you know, if you were really going to be taking some risk and having a lot of impact, since these were upside proof investments, your losses were going to outweigh your gains, and minus 20% felt like just kind of the right number. Um, but the foundation didn't like it, and, and, and so I recant. I never really meant to say that in the emails that show it are a lie. Um, but I, but I, but I, no, but in all seriousness, I do think that if, if you're going into PI, there's no evidence in the world we can find that, um, that really attractive financial returns before you consider mission are available. And I think where we found that balance is, look, Success financially is that we get our money back and that's good as a whole. Um, now let's talk about the other things which are, is this sustainable? Are the transaction costs killing us? Could we scale this up? Could we show it to someone else? Um, so deal flow, positive rate of return, sustainable scale. Um, 
Um, we launched in November. We made our first investment in March with a $250,000 loan from Control. We got the process interested. Um, we have a deal with, I think, Heather told me, we're going to close on June 30th. Um, we could be a million bucks, but we're going to split it with another fund we manage, and we're going to, and then we'll be alongside a very big investor for another million, so it's a $2 million facility. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the sign. Um, big thanks to the names that you know as part of that. Um, and you know, we're, we're, the process is evolving. Um, so you know, we now have a, a weekly call with the Office Foundation Mondays at four. Um, every Monday at four, we you know, we just learn how to to give the participants what what they want, um, what they need, and and benefit particularly with the Office Foundation um, from their deep programmatic and financial and financial knowledge. Um, we are laser focused on transaction costs. Laser focused. Out our hours, um, you know, it's just not success. Making a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan with a hundred thousand dollar transaction cost is not success. It's not success. And so it's just a balance. It's very hard for me, given what I used to do, um, to curb my enthusiasm to do deep due diligence on everything. At some point, you just have to say, look, you know, we we need to we need to scale the work effort to to match the investment size. Because it's not success to spend five hundred thousand dollars to make a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan unless you're really careful. So, uh, talk about the first goal this thing because I think that there was question of size or question of structure, question of risk, uh, and then also when it comes to not profit, for profit, uh, monetary raising. So this is strong. The first goal is not small. It's probably what I would call expansion capital. So. Um, so well respected workforce organization in the Bronx with a focus on IT. They um, have done a, are doing a, done a joint venture with a for-profit software consultancy to train and employ software testing. Um, and and originally that was that project was going to be a million five capital to fit out space in their headquarters to employ three hundred and fifty people. And as Grayson showed, um, the world being what it is. The million five ended up costing a million seven five, and it was difficult for them to go back. And they funded the million five; they raised a million five in grants. Grants. Um, it was difficult for them to go back to their grant makers for the extra two fifty, just the way grant calendars work. And they had the cash to put it in, but you know, you need to manage your balance sheet carefully as a not for profit. And so what we said was, we'll lend you the two fifty to close the gap. Um, but because this is a venture, because this is a venture, what, what we structured with them was a loan that would not immediately require servicing. Um, and it would only require servicing to the extent that the joint venture was successful, at least for a while. So it's a 5% loan, but for four years, their only obligation to make principal or interest payments is, is based on a percentage of the profit they were earning from the joint venture. So if the joint venture goes, or as these things go, goes, there's no financial gun to their head to serve as our loan. So it's almost like we're a participant in the joint venture for four years. At the end of four years, it's like, okay, you still have, if you haven't paid us back, then it becomes an unsecured obligation of Priscilla as the parent. And Priscilla as the parent is in pretty good shape financially, and we have some triggers that if things fall off, the wheels fall off the box of the parent, we have some ability to accelerate. But the notion is basically to say, let's be a participant in your business for four years. Let's be alongside there, you in that, and, and only at the end. And hopefully it succeeded, or if it's ever going to succeed, it succeeded, um, we can have a conversation about how you have to pay us back. And interestingly, in a, in a commercial situation, it's a bad thing they haven't paid us back within four years, and so the rate goes up. We actually pre-negotiated that the rate would, would go down because and we thought, you know, look, if it hasn't worked out for them in four years, this is the last time we want to be like kicking them in the teeth, penalizing them. That's when they're going to need a little bit of flexibility. And this is an organization that is supported on the grant making side by the Alton Foundation and by and by Hexer. So um, two of the three foundations that participated in this investment already know this organization well. And so due diligence is greatly. We 
we spent thirty-two thousand dollars in, in pro bono legal fees. So that's just a little sort of reminder. And I think we did a good job at getting this pro bono. But thirty-two thousand dollars against two hundred and fifty, like fifteen percent transaction cost legal alone. Um, so you know, it's just it's it, this was one where we collected by them really helped. Um, I'm going to show you one mind-numbing last chart. Because people ask how this works. These are phony numbers, but we, we, we made them so that it was easy. So let's pretend that the fund was a million dollars. So you see up in the top row it says available capital. And let's pretend that it came from five investors who each committed 100, 250, 250, 200, 200 to get to a million, right? Um, so now if we present a deal for $500,000 to the fund, every investor one, and everybody says, I'm in, they would fund it. 50, 125, 125, 100, 100. So everybody would take up their pro rata share of that deal. Okay. Um, now we present investment two, and it's $150,000. They have invested capital at 150. And the investor B says that he or she is not interested for whatever reason. Um, it's probably not because they have a nuanced view that's different than ours about the financial risk. Probably just because the issue area just doesn't ring a bell. And so that deal would be funded by the by those investors that choose to participate pro rata without considering number the, the B guy who's out. And then we have investment three, and investor D decides that they're not going to be in. And then to make the math work for investment four, everybody participates, and that's the end of the fund. So that's that's basically the way it works, that that, that we're presenting investments and Funder is deciding whether or not to participate. And obviously, it's iterative because maybe the Altman Foundation says they're in, but if nobody else says yes, then they say, well, we're not in because it's a million dollars and we didn't say we need the whole million dollars. So it's an iterative process, but the basic notion is you can choose what you want to do. Um, and what that means, if you look at the bottom, and again, these are phony numbers, that, that each investor from a financial standpoint may get a different return. So here, again, just to make the math easy, we pretended that an aggregate fund earns three and a half percent, so the million dollars turns into one million and thirty-five thousand um, dollars. But different investors could do better or worse financially um, because they may have opted in or opted out of good deals or bad deals. So in this case, um, investor D got the donkey because they 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 opted out of what turned out. To, I mean, they 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 were yes, they opted out of the good deal and were overweight the bad deal. Um, and so that's basically basically the nature of you know the nature of this fund. Um, and then the way it works is when when an investment repays, the fund just again distributes to the participants who are in it their pro rata share of the share of the proceeds. Um, so you know we think it's a clever structure. Um, it's only going to be as good as the people who are involved and their ability to you know to talk about stuff. Um, and I guess the final thing is we're, we're really trying to be careful going in to know what we would do if things go bad, because it's it will be a nightmare if if one of these investments wobbles and there's a difference of view then about what to do because we'll have to do something, you know. And if, if one funder says crack the whip and the other funder says like Let's, let's be flexible here. That's going to put us in a very difficult position. We have to do something. Um, and so I think we're trying to, to make sure that we pre discussed all the things that could go wrong and what we think, you know, what we think we can do in that, in that case. Yeah, so before you went into this illustration, uh, you were talking about um, during the four, first four years, um, you expect to have some proceeds, and then after the four-year period, then you'll renegotiate, or you'd have different terms that govern what that. Right, yeah. but right. So outside of that, that just uh, that specific example, we're involved in a PRI now where we don't have. Uh, it's a very sweet deal. It was made maybe over a decade ago, and it's a loan, uh, no interest, and uh, it's like pay us back as you sell these units of affordable housing, and it is written so loosely. We don't have any audit rights. So when I used to work 
work at a bank, we always had audit rights to say, well, let's look at your books to make sure that you are paying us back as you are making uh, a profit. Um, but we don't have any of those types of terms written into the, uh, the agreement. So I'm just really curious from your experience and I guess the entire panel's experience, how heavy-handed are you in writing those terms to make sure that you are protected? Prior to two years ago, CJ had not been a lender. Um, but starting two years ago, we merged with a group called Contact Fund, which is very experienced with lending for small nonprofits. And I come out of the private equity world where, you know, in many ways, these loans are much more like private equity investments. That there's no particular standard. You really need to be comfortable with your partner. Um, and so, on the one hand, we don't have a cookie cutter. But on the other hand, we're super explicit, super explicit. What we get, what rights we have, um, and and because so many not for profits are programmed to think, oh, basically this grant will be okay, we don't pay them back. Like for for school lists, we went back up to the Bronx, and I sat down with Twenty O and said, um, forget your lawyers, forget these legal documents you may or may not have read. You do understand what you're signing up for, right? Like you do. I like just want to make clear you understand what you're signing up for. And so I, I think being really explicit. <coughs> And then making sure, really, truly, they understand is very important. Whether what you ask for is is, is heavy-handed or not, separate. That being really explicit, having nothing loose. So that's what you do on the front end. Nothing right? loosey loosey, and you know, and being on the phone with, with them. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I think is good. You know, you're only as good as your funders, and, and we've promised our funders quarterly reports, and then that will be that will make us. We won't be able to stay out of touch with any of these borrowers for more than 80 minutes. Because, because when we're writing that quarterly report, if we haven't called them, we're going to have to call them. Um, and so just staying involved. We've asked, some people don't like it, but we've asked, we've asked that if things wobble at all, we have the right to go to board meetings ex officio. Um, because sometimes I think it's just, the boards don't even know. Like I just want to be there in the room and say, hey, guys, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe it is your fault. Maybe we can work with that. Maybe we can. But, you know, you're not paying us. You're supposed to pay us. So having, we, and, and I think. It's pretty non standard. We've, we've negotiated the right, if there's any sort of event of fault, to, to get in the boardroom. Um, and of course, the lawyers can work with them, but you're not going to do this. And that's the point is, we just want to be there. Um, we've asked to get in board reports, and rather than have them create a separate reporting mechanism for us to share that kind of stuff. So I think it's, I think it's very bespoke, um, uh, but it can't, it can't be vague. It cannot, I think it cannot be vague. Um, and you can't assume that the counterparty has remotely the same expectations or understanding you have about, you know, what's normal behavior. Um, the PLIs aren't normal. They're not. She's asking what do you what do you do? What's your definition of being exposed? I think well, uh, I think I think you have to give a good relationship with them. It's so frustrating. Uh, <laughs> But yes, okay. So we have we we have a we have a very fine relationship with them, and uh, mistakenly, one of our program officers, I say mistakenly, just wrote them a grant when they have an outstanding three million dollar loan to us and have not paid us but five hundred thousand, you know. And so it's yeah. So yeah, we have a fine relationship. It works for them very well. <laughs> I just think you need to you find a way to get into the room and say, look, this you know, this isn't working for us, we need a plan. Um, and, and particularly as Jennifer said, you know, the foundation community is relatively small and the last thing anybody should want is is yeah, feeling that there's there's someone around town who feels rightly aggrieved. So I, I think if you have that relationship then it's easy to try to get something like the audit, but without it, the document's not gonna help. Definitely has been worked out, and you know. But you, 
also have to be sophisticated. Sometimes there are members of the group who are taking a bit of a tax, and so you have to kind of move through the process and figure out where are you, what am I going after, you know, what am I trying to protect, and, and also keeping a longer view in mind about the relationship. And that. So I think, yeah, just um, going after it. And you know, it, it also speaks to what happens also on the inside of foundations, which is the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing or what the left hand really would like to do and wants to also tell. Other questions? Investment return side because 
anything you give up is a whole lot of grants not made in the future. So it, I think it's some variation on that. And and I think the people who, who are in PRI have not made some smart person calculation about you know the weighted average return versus the discount rate of world problems and the they, they they just they're living their values. I think they think, look, it just it just feels it just feels wrong. Somebody can prove it one way or the other. It just feels wrong to have none of our assets um, explicitly working you know, with respect to our mission. Now I think a lot of foundations may be doing stuff that we don't see, which is you know the non-program related Mission related investing, screening off tobacco or whatever bad stuff. So, I, I, but from in terms of actively putting money out into the world against their mission, my sense is it's, it's, a, it's a value and principle discussion and answer that people have made. It's not a calculation. Let's say how we went from zero to $10 million to the IRR program. The argument we made is we we provide, our foundation provides general support primarily. And over the years, we've realized the importance of advocacy. So we're putting a lot more money into advocacy for the various sectors. We said basically, there's a third leg in this stool, you know, that old expression, uh, that all, almost every one of the grantees has capital needs. And we're holding them back from carrying out their mission by not using capital that we have available, you know, the other 95%, and it worked. <laughs> you know, we went from zero to one million, four million to ten million in three years because once you made that first loan, other opportunities. You first you see them, right? It's like you, you can't see a bird in the bush, but when you see the first bird, you see all the rest of the birds, <laughs> and people know about you. And the board got excited about it, and we even decoupled. Uh, originally, we were carrying, ca counting it against our minimum distribution. We decoupled it to uncomplicate it. And that uh, convinced them to grow even more. So just by saying this is something we could be doing or not doing that everybody absolutely needs to take the next step, it seemed to resonate. We need to do this this big this program, and it has to be this percent of assets. You know, you know, kind of that top-down approach. I think is much less effective than having you know a team come and say, "We see this opportunity in the marketplace." Let's try. And we'll literally try and see how it goes. It's much more effective. And I would say, short of that, if you really feel like there's no room, John said something earlier that's so important: is to is to perhaps bring a financial lens to your grant making. So that you're even in a better position to say what you know, what's going on in the financial life of my grantee, and that's a really good first step for you as a grant making professional to say, okay, how do I? What's my own learning curve about how money's moving through these nonprofit enterprises and where where the might be an opportunity? Because the last thing you'd want to do is you know have sort of a misperception around if the financial condition of one of your favorite grantees put them up for a PRI and not having so well, because then you're just jeopardizing not only the foundation's resources, but also the relationship. Um, so that's also maybe another possible first step. I think one of the, one of the difficult niches for this whole sector to borrow is the niche of sort of slice of the market that is not being uh, pursued by the commercial banking sector. Because to provide PRIs, session radios, for Citibank would just be just exactly the one they got five percent in 1992, and what's the point of that? Uh, you could take the that present value and turn it to five and two, and just make a grant. So what's what's the point of that? And I suppose you could then conjure up some sort of justification, but that's really not what we want for TJ's case. And this is the point of the whole exercise for trying to find that part of the market which is uh, which represents a reasonably decent investment, albeit with a sometimes very high risk, where there is a substantial social return, which is certainly what this is. I think that we're a grant maker, TJ should know about his money. We are a grant maker, um, and now we're a lender investor. And I think one of the, I think 
sometimes people forget how huge grants are. Um, because by and large, no one ever says no. So you don't spend a lot of time. I've never heard a program officer said, I spent all this time, and then I offered them the grant, and they turned it down. <laughs> or like, Bank of America swooped in and gave them a grant on better terms. Like, what? So, so that the, 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 the um, you know, that, the, the fact that you work on things and they don't happen is, is something that's different. But also, and this is, this is where we were really focused with the funders, how quickly can we make decisions and who needs to make them? Because particularly if you've got co-investors, you can't have everything, in my view, you can't have each individual PRI decision, particularly if you're trying to do impactful stuff, decided by your board at the quarterly board meeting on the dock six weeks in advance, because the world won't wait. And so, you know, I think what's been really helpful is, is that speaking about Altman, you know, you've, you've designed a process that works for you from a governance standpoint, but also works for the not for profits and works for us. That you can respond quickly enough, you can get the finance community or whatever it is together. And that, that I think, is different than grant making. I mean, quite frankly, most grants, there's not a huge urgency. The board meeting's fine, it can all be approved. But if you're doing, this next deal we're doing, we're doing um, if Bank of America and the others are ready to go, we can't, we cannot say we're just going to have to hold on um, because we're one sixty seventh of the capital here, and we need to wait for the Hector Foundation so board meeting. That's going to be like a very short conversation. Just, just don't, <laughs> just don't try us uh, from say July fifteenth to Labor Day. Right. <laughs> um, and so that, so that, like, we don't want to be tested. How, how do you, how do you actually set yourself up internally? Do this stuff. It's, a, it's not a metaphysical question, it's a very practical question. Okay, and just as a footnote to that, we wanted to know more about the pipeline so that we could test out some things with our board and staff internally. And so while there's an urgency at the end, there's often a long gestation period. Um, and so figuring out how you uh, keep your business informed during that process so that when you need to make your so I actually have a question that kind of relates to that. I have two questions. One is, how do you build your pipeline? How do you source deals? Um, and the other is, how do you see or what is the potential interaction or not of PRIs with pay for success and social impact bonds and that whole world? Uh, so what would the role of you call it night or night free? You call it night free. Everybody else calls it night free. Night free. <laughs> but we like that. It's kind of I thought it was the other way around. No, night <laughs> free. Uh, so the possible role of night free and social impact bond uh, would be to be the buyer investor uh, of a piece of the deal. Uh, there's a uh, transaction. Transaction that Merrill Lynch did with uh, uh, the Hospital Association six months ago or eight months ago. Uh, uh, it was a $12 million transaction. I think Merrill offered in notes of $100,000 each. Uh, presumably, NIPRI, were NIPRI or its participants to be interested in personal recidivism or something. Structure. Will everybody know what SIDs are and about this? Um, uh, we could have been an investor, or uh, we could have, we could, in theory, step in where uh, Rockefeller and Robinhood stepped in as first loss absorbers. Remember that the structure of that transaction, uh, I think, Rock, I think if I remember correctly, Rockefeller uh, uh, absorbed. 10% of the first losses of the transaction, which doesn't do a huge amount for the economics, but the credibility of that particular commitment, apparently, according to what Merrill Lynch and his director uh, is huge for convincing investors in the Osborne Association that a worthwhile participant. No, that was that was to uh, provide funds to Osborne to do the intervention to lower prisoner recidivism. So where did they get? No, no, no. Go ahead. 
struggling with. Yeah. So that's why I know that Social enterprise, uh, you know, which is kind of blending of models, hybrid models, for profit models. And so, you know, like Grace was for grand, so, granddaddy of like the them social all, enterprise. Right? Yeah. And kind of, and that. So, I think also, you know, keeping flexible minds about entities that can be on the other side of your program related investments and the fact that they can be not only debt but also equity or other quasi types of equity. Um, is also so there's a range of possibility and it's really kind of figuring out you know what's the what's your goal who what's what are the right vehicles to reach your goal and then what's an acceptable set of criteria um, in your your context to really kind of make it happen. And those are and those are also I, mean, I think there's going to be a lot to do maybe not just in the part in um, in not for profit for profit joint ventures and maybe on healthcare. Giving them to change in the way healthcare is funded, I think nonprofits are going to have to partner up with either for profit or people who might as well be for profit because they're hospitals or you know, banks or other things. And, and you know, figuring out how, how to fund those um, where there is some earned revenue stream, it's possible that you're funding up for investment in IT or whatever. I think there's going to be, but those are very expensive from a diligence and management standpoint um, compared with real estate and working capital. They're very expensive. Hi, so I have a question about um, monitoring and evaluation from an international perspective, so things that are not taking place locally. So it seems like a lot of people have talked about New York-based stuff. Is there a situation that you've been in where it's international, and how does that complicate it for you? We never worry about whether we'll get our money back because the grants and it won't. Um, I don't think we could do. I don't think we could do anything. In, personally, I don't. Sea Change would not sign up to do this sort of work where we didn't have boots on the street. So, like an NFF or whatever, there's lots of groups that have boots on the street. Um, um, but, but I just think it's these are funky deals, and you need to be there. And you need to visit the site. We need to talk to the board chairs, and and I don't know how we could do it and not get crushed from a transaction cost standpoint because it's the airplane, not the subway, and, and you know we're going to have two hour meeting in Philadelphia is basically a day, to be honest. Um, so I, I don't I don't think we could do it. I don't think we could do it now. And and the history is not good. Like if you look at Info and others, um, and microfinance is slightly different because you know they're lending to lenders. Uh, but I don't I don't know how we could make direct. 
And in the fund, you can't, because anything outside New York couldn't be PRI for the Altman Foundation, for example, because the Altman Foundation's mission is only five boroughs. So it's not a problem we've thought about, but I don't I don't think we can do it. I just don't. Is there maybe like, for instance, your trusted partner, if you're doing grant making overseas, you know, it's, it's kind of like them combing through your relationships and saying, hmm, is there a trusted partner? Is there a way to experiment? We see a lot of our grantees that are turning into B Corps and they're expanding their operations to be for-profit businesses. And it see, and some of the, a lot of them all have, they all have nonprofit status here, but their operations are going to be taking place somewhere else. And I've been talking to Acumen Fund to see how they structure a lot of their work. It's still kind of confusing as somebody who's not, um, who's learning about it.
Great, thank you. Um, I have a quick question on the NIPRI fund specifically and then a more general question. The quick question on the NIPRI fund is um, how big is it and what is sort of an average percentage of assets of, of the folks involved that have put it, um, that have put into it? And then the kind of broader question is what does the market look like for intermediaries? Are there a lot of folks doing what you do? Um, and you know, what's been some of the experience around the table of trying to engage with intermediaries? So we, we raised, yeah, I, I think the partner from Cold War, we think this way, we were raising like 10 billion, 15 million dollar funds, and so I, I still come out of it, but the only thing worse than having not enough money is having too much money. So what we, what we wanted to do was 
have enough money to get out there and see what we can do for a couple of years. And if it works, we expand the pool either by getting larger commitments from the existing foundations or by growing it. So we raised about five million bucks, um, which we think should keep us in business for a couple of years and get you know, like six month transactions done. Um, it's hard to tell exactly, but I think the foundations in the in the fund have about a billion and a half dollars in total capital. So five million divided by a billion and a half is essentially zero. Um, <laughs> 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 um, that's, so I, I would say it's 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 and it's important because the foundations are spending real time and we're spending real time trying to do this right, and we have enough money to do that, but it's not. If it's, if it's a disaster financially, um, and, and of course we wouldn't say anything, so um, it's not a body blow if the foundation is doing this well. Any new ones? Uh, well, there are consultants that sort of show reels around, um, but I don't really see much of a new world. Maybe, yeah, maybe we're not in a position to see it. I think you could go to NFF, you could go to probably the FKC. And if you think of the pre existing intermediaries, you know, City Acquisition Trust, Intermediary, Risk, Enterprise, NFF, Trust for Citizen Watch, KC. Um, if you went to NFF and said, start NFF Try, um, you know, I think Anthony would, would do that. So I don't know, there's a few next steps, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I, I, I think our structure is a little bit different, um, and we're small enough that, 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 that this fund gets attention, which it probably wouldn't if you were an enterprise or less North City or Calvert. But I think there are people out there doing it um, who could do it. Anybody who has the last burning question? Those are all the English majors coming through with all these QI money. Question. <laughs> so, here's what I'd love you to do arts and culture and food. You know, we, we, the, the, the heat map for, our, for this activity is really it's, it's health and human services and education. That's kind of, it doesn't say that anywhere, but that's kind of where we are really mostly. Um, but I think there's something to do with arts and culture, and I think there's probably something to do with. Um, no, seriously. Um, you know, like, like the things that, that, that you're doing. Um, and and that, those would be areas that the foundation's interested in that work. And if it's a plug in, you know. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you uh, to our, our panelists. Thank you for your feedback and your honesty. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, it's great. Um, you know, we'll be here all week. So if you have any follow-up questions or concern work, any of us would be happy to talk to you. So thank you. So be great. Great. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. 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 We're stepping in like charter school, charter school, where they might have a state grant, but it's not fine to close it. We'll make a loan, which is a grant. And the security in that case was simply a pledge.